watching Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Clea Twain. In today's episode, I'll be talking to Rémi Brulin, a research fellow at New York University, about the concept of terrorism and its use in the Israeli-Palestinian context. Rémi, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Now, with the current military escalation against the Gaza Strip, there's been a lot of talk in the mainstream media about terrorism. Has that conversation been reflective of the way the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is usually handled? Um, well, yeah, the short answer would be would be yes, I think. Uh, I, I want to note, however, that there, there might be some uh, improvement or change in how the, the, the mainstream media is starting to cover the conflict. Uh, one possible uh, case in point uh, could be the um, program Upris Chris A's that uh, uh, took place was uh, aired uh, in on Sunday morning uh, on MSNBC, where for probably one of the very first times uh, you had several Palestinian voices actually on the set and uh, so giving a, a different perspective on conflicts. So I, I felt like this was new. Um, however, I'm not sure that um, this can be said about the, the way in which the media has covered the issue of terrorism itself. This still remains to me the one uh, point in the, uh, about the conflict uh, about which the media uh, use the term terrorism and yet are absolutely, completely silent about what it means, uh, how it is defined, who uses the term, in what ways, and what are the arguments on all sides. I think there was something interesting that happened. Uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey, Erdogan, uh, actually called Israel a terrorist state. It was reported in the media, and, and something that was interesting is how Matthew uh, Lee from AP actually asked uh, a spokesperson for the, the Obama administration to respond and to to probably condemn uh, Erdogan. And so there was this interesting exchange where at the end the spokesperson actually said that of course the, the US disagreed and thought it was not helpful. At the same time, um, Senator McCain and Senator uh, Graham, Republicans both, issued a statement also saying that they regretted what the, the prime minister, uh, Turkish prime minister said. And I have the, the statement in front of me and they start by saying, we regret that the prime minister of Turkey referred to Israel today as a terrorist state, quote unquote. Israel has the sovereign right, uh, as the same sovereign right as every country to defend itself. And no government could be expected to remain passive under the daily barrage of rockets, etc. And then they add, this challenge should be familiar to Turkey, which has been a victim of terrorism itself. And to me, this, this response is interesting because they don't really say anything about whether Israel is a terrorist state there, or rather if this is what they're saying. Their argument is basically that you cannot be uh, involved in terrorism if what you're doing is defending yourself against terrorism, which of course as an argument makes no sense. It is, it is an argument that basically confuses two issues. The issues, uh, if we talk in, in uh, international law terms or in um, just for theory terms, you have two concepts, right? You have use ad bellum, the, the right to go to war, and use in bello, the rights uh, when you are fighting, when you are in, in war. Um, Michael Walzer, author of uh, Just and Just Wars, professor, um, uh, 
talks about it as one is is an adjective you you fight a just war and then one is an adverb you fight justly and the two are completely separate and 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 what what McCain and Graham here uh, are saying uh, is extremely confusing it's confusing the two because it's obvious uh, that when you talk about war for example both sides can be committing war crimes both sides can be fighting unjustly the adverb and so in the case of terrorism it is also obvious so it should be uh, that both sides can be terrorists using terrorism and it of course makes no sense to say I'm not a terrorist because I'm fighting against the terrorist. It's obvious because the other side can say that. And of course, historically, the other side has said that, meaning that the Arabs, Arab states, or the Palestinians, many other others, the ANC are fighting in South Africa, they've all said at some point that they're not terrorists because they're fighting the terrorists. And obviously, when they use that argument, it's an argument that we reject, and we're right to reject it. So the, the, the answer here given by McCain and, and Graham really makes little sense, but what's more important probably is that this is, this is where the, the debate on the issue stops. It goes further than that, and in the media, uh, th this was the end of it, because it's, it's taken as obvious that it's a crazy idea to think of Israel as using terrorism. Well, let's let's focus a little bit on the U.S. for a while. Can you can you speak about how historically the U.S. government has used the term terrorism, specifically in this Israeli-Palestinian context? So um, here, I think something that's important is to, when we're talking about the the U.S. government, is to sort of separate in branches. Uh, something that I've um, done a lot of research about is trying to figure out when the discourse on terrorism or when the word terrorism starts being used uh, in presidential discourse, right? And, what you, and, and it's easy to do now, today, something that was not the case maybe 10 years ago, because we have those databases online and so we can look for this. And what you find is that actually up until Reagan, uh, or simplify, the, the word terrorism is basically not used by American presidents, right? Uh, Carter uses it uh, a lot at the, at, during the last year and a half of, of his mandate, uh, but, of his term, but it's only about the uh, hostage crisis in Iran. In that sense, there is no discourse on terrorism, as in terrorism itself is not presented or framed as a threat. It's only about Ir Iran and, uh, and that act of terrorism. If, if you go back, uh, and I, I go in more detail uh, about this in, in, a, in an interview that I did with Greenwald uh, on Salon a couple of years ago, uh, but very quickly, even if you look at uh, Munich, the, 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 the attacks by the Palestinians uh, on Israeli athletes uh, at Munich in 72 during the Olympic Games, this is the obvious example of terrorism that we can think of when we think about the conflict. And yet, at the time, Nixon, so he's president at the time, he does not use the term terrorism to talk about Munich. He calls them international outlaws. He calls them thugs. Of course, he, the, the act is, is rightly described as despicable, illegal, and everything. But it does not naturally refer to it as an act of terrorism. Uh, in, in the same way, uh, you had hijackings throughout the 60s up and, and, and into the 70s. The very first president to ever use the term terrorism to refer to an act against uh, civil aviation is, again, Nixon in March of 72, which is very, very late in the day, uh, when he gives his, uh, a speech presenting uh, uh, the creation of the air marshals. It's uh, oddly on, on se September 11th. 1970, which is odd, uh, he talks about hijackings and bombings of civilian airplanes. Not once does he call it terrorism. 
And, and so what, what's important to remember when you look back on, on, on that history is that terrorism is an umbrella term. What it does is that it puts all those acts uh, together and say that those acts form one threat and that it's just one threat and the same threat. Uh, this is not something that, uh, that was uh, felt as... Um, natural or, or that that American presidents felt like they needed to do up until uh, the 80s and and Reagan basically which is of course not not I'm not saying here because it would be historically profoundly inaccurate that the term did not exist before of course in the 60s and the 70s Israel for example used the term all the time to refer to use of force by Palestinians or pro-Palestinian groups. Acts, attacks in, 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 and it's important to, to mention that, uh, to refer to attacks against civilian targets, but also against military targets. Uh, in, in the Israeli discourse, there's no difference between the two. Um, so what was the turning point in the 80s then that, that made the discourse change? The 80s, um, when you when you go back and you look at the first two or three years of um, of the Reagan uh, term, that what's what's odd in retrospect is that he's actually not really using the term to refer to events in the Middle East. What he's really referring to is events in Central America. And when he's talking about terrorism, he's mostly talking about the FMLN in El Salvador and saying that the U.S. should give military aid to the Salvadoran regime so that they can fight terrorism. Uh, it's, it's mostly where it is uh, focused. Um, in, if there is one point where we can say that when it comes to the presidential discourse, things do change, it's with the attack uh, against the U.S. Marines stationed in Beirut in October of 83. What's Fascinating when you go back is that since the the, um, the beginning of of, uh, uh, of the crisis between Israel and Lebanon, uh, if we can talk about a specific beginning, let's say June of eighty one, well, when we're talking about Beirut and and the headquarters uh, of the PLO that are bombed in June of, of eighty one. Israel, of course, is saying that what they're going after is the headquarters of this big terrorist organization that is the PLO, and that they go against the terrorist infrastructure of the PLO. Um, but the U.S. is not saying that. At least Reagan does not say that. He mentions terrorism a couple times when talking about uh, about Israel and what Israel is doing once it invades Lebanon one year later in June of 82. But that's it. For, so from June 82 to October 83, maybe a couple mentions of terrorism. So when he talks about Israel and Lebanon, this is not about terrorism. It's about something else. And suddenly, as soon as the U.S. Marines are attacked and bombed, and 250 of them are killed by a truck bomb, uh, suddenly it becomes about terrorism, meaning that the U.S., uh, presence and the is about terrorism. The U.S. objectives become about fighting terrorism and defeating the terrorists, and uh, and at the same time, retroactively, in hindsight, starts talking about the reason why Israel invaded a year later, uh, a, a year earlier in '82, as of course having been about fighting the terrorists, right? So suddenly, retroactively, what happened a year before is presented as, of course, obviously having been about fighting terrorism. And, and then at the same time, we are in October of 83, um, the U.S. invades Grenada, and you have a Korean, um, an airplane that's, an, a Korean, I think, airplane that is um, downed by the Soviet Union. It's an accident, but Reagan calls it an act of terrorism, and he has this big discourse in late 83, when he says that all these things are, happen, are happening uh, thousands of miles apart, one from the other, but they're all part of the same big threat, the threat of international terrorism. And at the heart of this threat of international terrorism is, of course, the Soviet Union. We're in the middle of the Cold War. 
and its allies. And amongst its allies, you have Arab states and you have the Central American states like uh, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua and Cuba. And so suddenly you have this huge threat. It's the same threat. They're all the same. They're all the terrorists and we have to fight the terrorists. So that, that's really the turning point. And, and, but something that's important, to, again, is that uh, in, in a way what, what the U.S. is doing from uh, late 83 onwards is incorporate or is take the Israeli discourse, right? And, and here the, something that's, of course, interesting is the role that uh, uh, um, an organization like the Jonathan Institute's which um, is it's called the Jonathan, Jonathan Institute. It's an Israeli organization um, called after called Jonathan after the, the name of Benjamin Netanyahu's brother who was killed during the, the raid at Antebe in '76. Um, so, member of the Israeli special forces, and the objective of this of this Jonathan Institute, they have conferences about terrorism. The first big conference takes place in 97, uh, in 79, and the second in Jerusalem, and the second one takes place in Washington in 84. And the objective stated explicitly is to convince the rest of the world, the West, or, or the civilized world, as they, they call it, that there is a threat, that it's the threat that, that uh, Israel has been fighting against is also a threat that the whole world, the whole Western world, should fight against. And I have um, uh, I have a quotation from from um, the Jonathan Institute, if you want. In, in '79, uh, Netanyahu uh, gave the objective of the Jonathan Institute's conference in Jerusalem as being to focus public attention on the real nature of international terrorism on the threat that it poses to all democratic societies and on the measures necessary for defeating the forces of terror. And in 84, so the, the, the second conference, it, this time it takes place in Washington, uh, he reminds everyone that a few years before the, the previous, the first conference exposed for the first time the full involvement of states in international terrorism, and the centrality of the Soviet Union and the PLO in fomenting and spreading terrorism. But he adds, though the conference helped focus the attention of influential circles in the West on the real nature of the terrorist threat, this was not enough. What was still lacking was a coherent and united international response. To advocate such a united policy and to suggest what it might consist of is the principal objective of the Washington conference. And indeed, during that second conference in 84, uh, most of the emphasis is going to be on the question of how to respond to international terrorism and more specifically on the question of the use of force, preemptively or preventively, against terrorism. And of course, uh, most, if not all, of, of the participants at the conference, and this includes um, US uh, officials of the, the Reagan administration. You have George Shultz, who is the Secretary of State at the time. You have uh, Jane Kirkpatrick, who is the US ambassador at the UN at the time, and, and many other American officials and Israeli officials all come on the side of, of course, the necessity of the West um, having moral, what they call moral clarity, and uh, pu pushing aside what they call moral equivalency, being very clear about who the, the, the terrorists are and who the enemy are, uh, is, and how serious the threat is. And they all come on the side of the use of force against international terrorism. And some of them, in, in fact, explicitly give the invasion of Lebanon as the example that the West should follow in fighting international terrorism. This is the, in the middle of the, of, at the end of the first term um, during the Reagan administration. At the time, there are internal debates inside 
the Reagan administration about the morality and the legality of using force against terrorism. This is not something that everyone agrees on. Uh, within the Reagan administration, you have debates uh, broadly uh, uh, explained between, on one side, Schultz and the State Department, on the other side, the DOD and Weinberger. And the DOD is, is reluctant to actually use force against terrorism. They don't think it's a serious threat, and they're uh, bothered that, by the morality of it. Um, and Reagan himself is, uh, is it, it's unclear where he is on, on this issue, but there are several quotes where you can really, uh, you, you can really see how far we've gone today when we talk about the use of force uh, against terrorism. I, I have a, 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 a few here. Uh, Reagan, in, in, it's on November 27th, 84. Uh, it, he's been... To give you the, the background, um, in late January 81, Reagan um, is welcoming back the, the American hostages from, uh, um, from Tehran. And he gives a, a famous speech where he, he promises the American people that the terrorists will be met with swift retribution. And so throughout his, um, his first and then his second term, journalists are going to be asking when are we going to see journalists or crit critics of the administration from the right uh, are going to be asking when are we going to see those swift retributions? Because, of course, uh, you have uh, hostages in Beirut and other acts of terrorism all over the place, and the U.S. is not using force. And so many times Reagan actually has to answer those questions. And this is how he answers. November 27th, 84. You've got to be able to get some evidence as to where are the bases from whence come these terrorists that you could strike at. At the same time, you have to recognize that you don't want to just carelessly go out and maybe kill innocent people. Then you're as bad as the terrorists. A few weeks later, that's January 14th, 85, right now the terrorists, one of the things that has kept us from retaliation is the difficulty in getting definite information enough as to who they are and where they are, that you do not risk killing, doing the same thing they're doing, killing innocent people in an effort to get at them. Same thing in February, where he clearly says that if you do that, you're a terrorist. Same thing in June, where he again says that if you use uh, force and kill a lot of innocents and it's indiscriminate, you're a terrorist too. And of course, that takes us back to the argument, if you want to call it that, uh, that's put forward by, um, by McCain and Graham in their statement. You can use the, the words of Ronald, Ronald Reagan to show very clearly that you can be a terrorist when you're fighting the terrorist, if the, the means that you use are fully indiscriminate. And it's striking to me that to be critical, say, of... Israel's actions today in Gaza, you only have to go back to Reagan and quote him. And it's difficult to not reach the conclusion that, at least in some respects, uh, in, in certain specific cases of certain specific strikes, Israel is using means that Reagan would have called terrorism. And, and there's the last one that's interesting also on the issue of uh, targeted killings or target, targeted assassinations. Uh, of course, only uh, 10 years ago, the, this was not US official policy. And uh, you only need to go back to 2002 or 2003, uh, 2001, sorry, just before 9-11 to find Democrats being extremely critical of the idea of a targeted killing when used by, uh, by Israel and, re and Republicans being critical of it. Uh, up to basically August of 2001, this is something that the U.S. rejects, um, and this is uh, this is what Reagan said uh, in January of '86. Uh, Senator Mettenbaum um, said that the U the U.S. should be uh, thinking seriously about assassinating Muhammad Gaddafi, and so Reagan was asked about what he thought, and he said, "You don't join them at their level." Terrorism in response to terrorism is not the answer. It is terrorism that is the evil. There is a moral issue involved here.
which is a, a, a great quote because it reminds us that it is terrorism itself and, and that, that is the evil. Meaning that the only way that that stands against terrorism is morally principled is if we apply it to all sides, which is pretty obvious, but uh, that, that makes very clear that a, uh, a statement such as the one by, by McCain and Graham uh, doesn't answer any of the big questions, right? And it shows, of course, how far the, the, the terms of the debate have evolved and, and how the U.S. has accepted what Israel has always said about how to fight terrorism. And, and, and this is, in fact, something that the, um, Israel has always said at the U.N., the Security Council, when there has been criticism about, about its uses of force. And so do you think that the U.S. has kind of mirrored the, the Israeli discourse because of lobbying by groups like the Jonathan Group, or is it related to the U.S.'s own history and its own wars, for example, in Afghanistan and in Iraq? Um, well, it, it's, that's one of the questions that it's, it's difficult as a historian to, to answer. Uh, because I'm not in, in the head of any of those uh, American leaders. I don't know what they thought and why exactly they, they did it that way. What, what is very clear is that um, the current stance, the, the current American stance on how to fight terrorism, meaning that uh, it is legitimate to use force uh, against the terrorists and against the states that harbor or support the terrorists. Uh, it is new in the American discourse uh, but it, it is not new when you go back to uh, how the U.S. talked about those questions at the Security Council in the specific case of Israel being accused by various Arab states or the Soviet Union and its allies of, um, of using force against the terrorists. Uh, since 72, uh, in fact on September 10th, 1972, following uh, Munich and, and, and uh, the airstrikes by Israel uh, against various um, uh, terrorist quote -unquote, camps in, in, in neighboring countries, the Security Council uh, deals with the issue of the use of force against terrorism. And uh, the U.S. uses its veto. It's only the second time in, in, in its history that at the time it uses its veto uh, George Bush, senior, of course, is the U.S. ambassador at the time, and he explains that from from now on, uh, the U.S. position is going to be uh, to veto any resolution that is one-sided. And by one-sided, he explains the U.S. means that it uh, is critical of or it condemns uh, uses of force by Israel without, at the same time, giving the, the, the context, and by context, it means that the root causes of the use of force by Israel is um, the, the question of, of terrorism and the role of states in terrorism. So this is on, on September 10th, uh, 1972. Uh, the U.S. is not saying during those years, during the, the, in the 70s, uh, that it is legitimate to use force against terrorism. But every time the, it, it simply is saying that uh, this is the framework uh, within which the use of force by Israel should be seen. Uh, but at the same time, it always uses its veto um, whenever a resolution is going to condemn Israel and it condemn its uses of force. And also uses its veto, or rather threatens to use its veto whenever the other uh, members of the Security Council want to call what is want to call what Israel did state terrorism, and if you indeed look at the debates throughout the 70s from the beginning and and up until now, whenever the issue of the use of force by Israel uh, is brought up, many states are of the position that what Israel does and has done for many years and what the Zionist groups did before the creation of the State of Israel is that it is terrorism. And if you look at the drafts of so many, so many resolutions put forward uh, during those years, uh, 
The word state terrorism is there very, very often. But it never appears in the final resolutions because if it is even put on the table, the U.S. Uh, threatens to veto. Uh, sometimes the, the U.S. even threatens to veto if there is mention of civilian casualties uh, um, caused by, by Israeli strikes. Uh, so this has been the position of the U.S. since uh, 72 at the, at the U.N. Security Council. And the first time that the U.S. actually makes it its own official position is in, in, in 86. Uh, in 85, when, when it, um, uh, it sends um, jet airplanes to hijack, quote-unquote, uh, a plane that were, that were uh, the Achille Lauro uh, terrorists were, uh, were flying. And then in 86, when uh, the U.S. Uh, just um, uh, had some missile strikes uh, against um, and airplane strikes against Libya, and then from that moment on, it becomes actually the U.S. position at the Security Council uh, in that one case that it is legitimate to use force against uh, terrorists and, and the terrorist states. But it, it took 14, 15 years, to, and, and then it would more or less disappear for a few years and come back here and there. Um, but it has been the position of, the, of Israel uh, from the very beginning. And you can read... Uh, you can read speeches given by Israeli representative in 72, and they literally sound like the speeches by uh, Bush, meaning a W. Bush, post 9-11 speeches at the UN. They sound exactly the same. Um, what's interesting, though, is that the US takes a very different uh, position at the General Assembly, as opposed to, uh, to the Security Council. Um, and, 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 and it sort of makes sense because at the General Assembly, uh, they don't have veto, veto power. And, and so what they're, go they're, they're going to do, and, and really to summarize very, very quickly, um, during the Reagan years, what the U.S. is going to be saying, because it's faced with uh, accusations of state terrorism or state-sponsored terrorism all the time at the General Assembly, right? Uh, you have non-aligned countries or you have Soviet Union allies who consistently uh, state that the U.S. Uh, is involved in state terrorism or state-sponsored terrorism. The state terrorism is during the 70s, for example, because of Vietnam. Uh, it is from the get-go because from the 70s on because of U.S. Uh, support for South Africa and for all those states. South Africa is, is a terrorist state because of apartheid and the terrorist regime. It's because of U.S. support for Israel and, of course, for all those states. Uh, Israel itself is a, is a terrorist state. Um, and so U.S. support for those states means that it's also involved in state terrorism. Uh, but also accusations uh, for state-sponsored terrorism. For example, um, the support for the Contras in the 80s is for majority of uh, member states at the General Assembly a clear case of state-sponsored terrorism by the U.S. Or uh, the role of the CIA uh, in, San in, in, uh, in Nicaragua, mining the harbors in 84, for example, is for them an act uh, it is clearly an act of state-sponsored terrorism, or the, the roles of the uh, anti-Castro Cubans in, um, in Florida and their role is in acts of terrorism is for them a, a clear case of the U.S. being sponsoring terrorism or at least harboring ter terrorists and not doing anything against them. So in that context, of an extremely adversarial context, uh, the U.S. during the 80s, during Reagan, the Reagan years, is not going to say that um, uh, it's not going to de deny all those acts. What it's going to say is that if a if a state is involved in an act of terrorism in any way, shape, or form, uh, meaning uh, uh, if a state is involved directly or indirectly in an act of terrorism, then it's not an act of terrorism. Right? So they're going to say in 81, in 83, 85, 87, 89, and 91, every other year, they're going to say that those uh, accusations make no sense in the 
context of debates about international terrorism because they refer to uh, acts in which a state, the US, the United States, is involved. And if that's the case, it's already covered by international law, uh, by the UN Charter, um, etc. And therefore, uh, and they use those terms, it is neither useful nor necessary to use the term international terrorism to condemn those acts because they're already covered by international law, right? Uh, so that's what they, they keep repeating throughout the 80s. And of course, in, in, in a way, this, this legal argument, because this takes place uh, uh, in the sixth committee, the legal committee of the uh, General Assembly, where the debates on international terrorism have happened since 72, following Munich. Um, the, the argument makes sense uh, from a legal standpoint because it has the merit of not separating state-sponsored terrorism and state terrorism, right? So if, if a state is involved, uh, either you decide that it's terrorism, and so you accept both concepts, or you decide that it's not, and so you reject both. But you don't, you don't split it in two, because legally it makes no sense, because the issue is state responsibility. Um, and, and so it really makes no sense to... Uh, to say that state-sponsored terrorism exists, for example, but state terrorism, as in the direct use of force by a state, for example, by its, I don't know, intelligence services agents, it doesn't make sense to say that this does not exist. And uh, there's a very specific case that's put forward by the US in, in 83. You had had uh, an assassination attempt in Rangoon against the South Korean prime minister and for the first two or three, three weeks, everyone thought that it was a non-state act, right, by, by a group of North Koreans. Uh, and then there's an investigation, and everyone realizes that actually uh, the perpetrators were members of the North Korean army, two officers from, from the North Korean army. And so during the, the, the subsequent debates on international terrorism at the UN, the U.S. is going to be the only country to state that uh, the, the committee should not be talking about Rangoon because Rangoon is not an act of international terrorism. And, and specifically, Rosenstock, who is the, um, uh, the representative of the U.S. at the time, says very clearly that for a few weeks, we thought that it was an act of terrorism, the kind that the committee should be talking about and acting against. But actually, it turns out that it's state agents, and because it's state agents, it's not an act of terrorism, because it's already covered by international law, right? And so th this argument makes sense, and it has the obvious benefit for the U.S. of the General Assembly that, by definition, the U.S. cannot be involved in terrorism, because if a state is involved, it's not terrorism. The problem is that, at the same time, Ronald Reagan, when he talks to the American people, is every other day talking about state-sponsored terrorism and in fact mentions Rangoon and mentions the attack against uh, the Marines and mentions uh, the Soviet Union downing an airplane, all acts in which states are involved and uses that to create this international terrorist threat. And of course you cannot have it both ways. But what's fascinating about the American discourse or discourses, plural, is that the U.S. has been able to have it both ways, or three ways, or four ways. It has been able to say something to the American public and use a completely different definition at the General Assembly and a completely different definition at the, the Security Council. And no one knows because the media, and this is an important, important part of that whole thing, the media has never covered those debates at the U.N., and experts on terrorism have actually not looked at the U.S. position during these debates either. And this applies to U.S. Congress also, where the, the question of the definition has been talked about over and over and over again. And it's obvious when you look at these debates that there's no agreement within Washington itself about what terrorism is. And yet those debates are not covered. Uh, and so, and, and in the media, the, the term is used as if everyone read about what terrorism is, which of course is absolutely not the case.
And now, more recently, the, the State Department issued a report uh, designating some acts of Israeli settler violence as terrorism. How significant is that report? Yes. Uh, yeah, the report came out uh, at some point in, uh, in August. Um, and it was reported as, as significant and as the first time that the State Department had used the term terrorism to talk about not Palestinians only, but actually Israeli settlers. Um, so it is true that this is what the, um, uh, the State Department did, but it was not the first time. Uh, I l looked it up and it's very easy to, to, to check. Uh, because everything is is online, and you can go back all the way to '85 and find mention of Israeli extremists, uh, uh, for example, killing, um, uh, attacking two uh, two mayors in, in 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 the West Bank, and this is called an act of terrorism uh, by the State Department. Um, so it, it's not really new, but and and probably more importantly. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us either that that the State Department uh, does use the term terrorism when it talks about uh, uh, extremist settlers, nor that this is also how the Israeli government speaks about those acts. Uh, because there's nothing about this such a position that is actually threatening to the discourse on terrorism. The issue about, and, and in fact, if you look, uh, in there, you have uh, at least one attack uh, that is of Israeli settlers attacking um, uh, Israeli IDF soldiers, right? And of course, the, the two big issues about the definition of, of terrorism are, does state terrorism exist or is it only groups that can be called ter uh, terrorists? Uh, and of course, this is simply confirming the fact that Settlers, meaning non-state actors, can be terrorists. So it's not, in that sense, threatening to the, the, the discourse on terrorism. And the other issue is whether all uses of force by non-state actors are terrorism or only specific uh, instances of uses of force by non-state actors, meaning only those about against innocent civilians or non-combatants. And in this case, clearly, the State Department and the uh, Israeli government is using the term terrorism to talk about Israeli settlers attacking military IDF soldiers. Uh, and and this, is, this has been also like a, a very central argument um, at the General Assembly, uh, because for, for one side uh, in the debate, the issue has always been um, that to them, the West, uh, spoken of broadly, the West is using the term terrorism to refer to all uses of force, of force by what they call national liberation movements, right? For example, South Africa is calling whatever the ANC does violently, sabotage, economic sabotage, terrorism. And they have their own laws about terrorism and terrorism is defined extremely broadly in those laws. And this is what Israel is doing also. And, and in fact, for the, for the first time in 87, Syria uh, put forward uh, uh, a proposal uh, when the resolutions on international terrorism were proposed, a proposal that said that um, there should be an international conference to define terrorism and, and differentiate between um, terrorism and le legitimate uh, uses of force for national liberation, right? Uh, the positions of all unaligned and, ally and Soviet Union allies country, meaning the huge majority of member states, were in favor of having such a conference because they want a definition of terrorism because they feel that this term is not, has not been defined and is always used against them. And, and they feel like they need the protection that a definition that's agreed upon by everybody would give them. So they're in favor of it, which is not to say, of course, that they, they all agree on what terrorism would be. But what is striking is that Syria actually very explicitly in 83 and 85 and 87, very explicitly said what we're interested in is 
that there is a clear difference between attacking civilians and, the, for example, they, they talk about the Achille Laro and the Palestinians and said this is against civilians, this is terrorism, there is no doubt. But, and they give examples of, of forces um, uh, in, in, in the, the, the Golan Heights and, and their own territories that are occupied at the time and said attacks, suicide attacks against uh, occupying military forces are not acts of terrorism, right? So that's their position. Syria's position is very clear. Uh, again, it's not the case for all Arab states. Some of them say that give the impression that if it's for a good cause, uh, it's not terrorism, right? But Syria is very clear. And and uh, on the other side, Israel and the U.S. opposed to the idea of an international conference on terrorism in '87. Since '72, in fact, in '87 and since then. Just like, like the rest of the Western world has been opposed, the argument being that there, there will not be uh, an agreement because it's too difficult, so we should not have uh, a conference. Um, the US and Israel very clearly, uh, when they react to what Syria said, clearly say that for them, this is an act of terrorism, right? That suicide attack, obviously it's extremely violent, it's a suicide attack, but the target is, is military. And for them, it, it is, and it should be considered an act of terrorism. Uh, so that, that, that was the position of, of, of the U.S. In, in those years. And it's, in fact, very difficult to figure out exactly, if you, lo if you look at debates at the General Assembly, what is the actual official position of the U.S. on the question of the legitimacy of the use of force by non-state actors? It's, they basically do not talk about it openly, uh, but their votes against various uh, self-determination resolutions in, in other committees gives the sense that, that give the sense that apparently they reject, they continue to reject uh, the idea that it's, it is legitimate to use force, any kind of force, if you're a non-state actor. And of course, it's ironic because this is the 80s. And this is the Reagan Doctrine years. And of course, the Reagan Doctrine is about freedom fighters and how, uh, to quote Reagan from his State of the Union address in early 85, uh, support for freedom fighters is self-defense. So again, you have a clear contrast between what the U.S. say at the U.N. about the use of force, where it's illegitimate and most of it, if not all of it, is terrorism. And at the same time, you have Reagan saying that support for freedom fighters not only is fine, but it's actually self-defense. And of course, the, the two are not compatible, and the only way that they are is, and that no one knows, is because the media, once again, does not cover those issues. Now, you've, you've touched upon this briefly before, but I just wanted to get your take on where the U.S. Congress stands in all of this. So on, on the issue broadly of, of terrorism, uh, Congress sort of, uh, starts talking about it and have hearings about international terrorism per se in and of itself for the first time in, in 74. Uh, and what's interesting is that at the time, the, um, the experts that are called to talk about terrorism have no problem talking about state terrorism. So non-state terrorism, of course, but also state, state terrorism. Um, and they actually have no problem talking about certain uses of force by the U.S. in Vietnam as being acts of state terrorism, or um, uses of force by Israel, as not all of them, but some of them, as being acts of state terrorism. So that's 74. And those experts are not, uh, I don't know, radical leftists. You have Brian Jenkins, who works for the RAND Corporation at the time and is a, a very well-known terrorism expert. You have uh, Ernst uh, Lefebvre, who... Uh, who was very close to being um, um, to, to be, being uh, an official and the Reagan and everything. So those are not radicals. Anyway, um, throughout the 70s, the, the, the issue of terrorism comes up uh, in the context of uh, Latin America and Central America, disappearances, death squads, and all that. This is considered terrorism. And then, more importantly to, to the subject uh, at hand right now, uh, starting in, in uh, 77, from 70, 77 to 79, you have discussions about 
the idea of coming up with a list of state sponsors of terrorism. Uh, this is an idea uh, that comes from um, Senators uh, Javits and Ribikov, a Democrat and a Republican. And the idea is very clearly, uh, their idea is to come up with a list of terrorist state and very, very clearly the focus would be um, on the states who give aid and support to the PLO. You have very long debates and of course there is um, uh, a tug of war, a struggle between the executive branch and the legislative branch and at the time the context of course is Carter trying to negotiate uh, the Camp David Accords and he realizes that such a list would tie his hands because suddenly he would not be allowed to talk with those states because they would be on the list, uh, Egypt and other states that he's talking to at the time. Uh, so there's a tug of war and there's the issue of the definition and there is no agreement amongst Democrats or Republicans exactly about how you could define terrorism in such a way that, for example, Saudi Arabia would not be on the list because, of course, at the time, Saudi Arabia is giving support to the PLO and other terrorist groups. Uh, but no one in Congress or uh, in the executive branch would want to have Saudi Arabia on the list and then not be allowed to have to take sanctions or not be allowed to uh, give support to Saudi Arabia, so sell Saudi Arabia weapons or whatever. So it fails. The, the Congress is not able at the time to come up with a list but and yet we have a list, and it's because uh, Fenwick, who was um, a represent, representative from New Jersey, um, actually um, picked up the idea of the list and put it on the rider to a larger bill, uh, and it was accepted without any debates. And so uh, uh, a few months later, the, the State Department, uh, because uh, uh, according to that, uh, Fenwick, Fenwick Amendment. Uh, it was up to the State Department to designate the, um, the sponsors of terrorists. Uh, following that, we have the list, and we have four or five states who are on the list, and then they'll be on and off. Um, so this is uh, how the, the, the Congress started dealing um, with the issue. Uh, and then there's the, they, they dealt also with the, the issue of material support for terrorism, which is a something that um, is very important these days and that the Supreme Court just ruled on um, in a few important cases recently. Uh, there are debates about this in 84 uh, for, for the first time in long debates. And once again, the, there's uh, absolute inability on the part of Congress to legislate on material support for terrorism because there's complete disagreement on who the terrorists are. Because for the Democrats, uh, uh, the NC, for example, are not terrorists, whereas they are terrorists for the Republicans. Uh, the FMLN might be uh, terrorist, but, but not all Democrats would agree. But more importantly for them, the death squads in, in El Salvador would be, and the Republicans don't agree. Uh, and it goes on and on. Of course, you have the contrast. And, and on the case of, of, of the contrast, the Democrats think that they're terrorists and of course for the Republicans, they're freedom fighters. And so you have no agreement uh, on the definition of, of terrorism and you have fascinating um, discussions between Democrats who want to know exactly how the executive branch uh, would make those decisions. And the answer that they get all the time is that it, it, it would not be uh, it, it, it would not be acceptable for, for the, the representative of the executive branch to guess what, what its department or what the executive branch would decide in the future. So they decide not to, not to respond. And so there is basically uh, no argument, uh, no agreement on the material support of terrorism because there is no agreement on the definition. And also, of course, because of civil liberties issues and freedom of speech issues about definition of what giving services to terrorists mean, what, what kind of expertise, what does it mean, everything. All those debates, of course, uh, are still um, at the heart of, of the, the um, recent decision by the, the Supreme Court on the case uh, Holder versus uh, Humanitarian law project that was decided in, uh, in 2010, um, two years ago. Uh, 
and it is, of course, because there, there is now a, a, a material support for terrorism statute. It was, um, it, it, it was passed in 1996 and under Clinton. And one major reason why it was passed, there is political obvious reasons and context. It's just one year after the, the Oklahoma City bombing and people want to act in Congress against terrorism. But the other major context is that the Cold War is over. And so there are no very clear conflicts where Democrats and Republicans could be in, in, disagree, in disagreement about who the terrorists are. And, uh, and also the, the events in, in, in Ireland are over. And because that, that's also a big issue when we think today in terms of charities and mostly Muslim charities, right? So that would be the other decision that the Supreme Court just reached to actually not uh, not, hear, not not grant the appeal of the Holy Land Foundation a few days ago, a few weeks ago. Uh, at the time in the in the nineties, uh, many many Irish Americans are giving money uh, to Irish uh, charities, and everyone knows that these are fronts and that they go to the IRA, meaning to terrorists. And you have in fact. Uh, Margaret Thatcher is always complaining at the time that there is no extradition agreement between the U.S. and and, uh, and and Great Britain and that the U.S. is helping the terrorists over there and everything. All of this is pretty much gone in 96 and all the terrorists, quote unquote, that are left uh, are in the Middle East. And, in, in, and, and this is the conflict about the conflicts, plural, about which there is agreement between Democrats and Republicans. So in that sense, there's a big hurdle that, that's out of the way. And this, to me, explains uh, to a great extent how there, there, there is the, the material support of terrorism law got passed. And of course, it applies only to designated foreign, foreign ter terrorist organizations, uh, not to all terrorists, right? And recently, the, there was the big issue of the M MEK, and they, they have been just delisted. Uh, and it had become problematic for for because lots of uh, it it had been on the list of, of terrorist groups for many many years, and uh, George Bush himself in two thousand three when making the case for the war in Iraq had mentioned the fact that uh, Saddam Hussein was uh, um, giving um, uh, was hosting um, the MEK. And so that was a part of the fact that he was part of the terrorist threat and linked to Al-Qaeda, um, broadly speaking. Recently, Dem Democrats and Republicans officials from both parties had been talking to the MEK and talking for the MEK and calling for the listing of the, uh, this organization. And the State Department recently actually took the MEK out of the list. Uh, and of course, if you look at, and, and those officials got money uh, from the AK to speak um, um, in their favor and to get them delisted. And if you look at the, the, um, at the Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project um, decision, there is material support if there is coordination or control between the, the people uh, who are giving the support and the group. And in, in that case, there was control. There was even money being exchanged. Uh, and so the, the way that problem gets solved is by delisting the MEK. And of course, the MEK is opposed to Iran and might, I don't know, might have been involved in, uh, in, in the assassination of, of various nuclear scientists in Iran. We don't know very, very well. Might probably have done that with Israeli help and support. We don't know exactly. Uh, so they get that the, the solution is obvious, they, they get delisted. But, but again, if we imagine for a second that I, don't, I hope, obviously, that this is not going to happen, but if troubles in, in, uh, in Ireland started again and, and suddenly the U.S. would be left with uh, laws that many, many, many American citizens would be troubled with because of what it does to the civil liberties and free speech, Irish Americans would be irate, would be really angry that, that they, they cannot give any money to any charity because somehow 
uh, as the Supreme Court decided, money is fungible, meaning that even if you give it to the humanitarian, humanitarian group, it is fungible, meaning that it frees uh, space for you to fund your terrorism. Uh, if that uh, standard was applied to groups that we want to help, uh, the ANC in the 80s, uh, the IRA for, for Irish Americans, the Mujahideen in the 80s, right? The Contras in the 80s, obviously there would be an uproar and people would realize that this is impossible. The, the problem right now is that everyone apparently agrees on who the terrorists are and they're all located in, in the Middle East. So the issue of terrorism does, uh, and the definition of terrorism doesn't strike anyone as being a problem. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. But thank you very much for being with us on Palestine Studies TV. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.